Wine, which is uh, made from grapes, is either red or yellow. And what else do you need to know? Well, there's history and geography. We're in California, and I'm on a mission to find the affordable American wine. Yes, and I see it more as a voyage of discovery, and I'm keen to show James there is a real history here. So, we'll visit the oldest vines. That is the biggest bunch of grapes I've ever seen. Drink the wines they produce. It's a taste of the still fairly wild west. And meet the heroes who saved them from beverage oblivion. Along the way, we'll cover all the bases. Wine, women and song. Come on, baby, let the good times roll. Our next destination is well known for I left my heart. Oh, give it up, man. Um, and the policing efforts of Carl Malden and Michael Douglas. We are, of course, heading to the streets of San Francisco. This, this week's, week's episode, episode is in Fandel. On this leg of our journey, my goal is to seduce James away from the high-volume, mass-produced wines he fell for at our last stop. Three million bottles a day, that's winemaking. And I think Zinfandel is just the thing to do it, as it's both excellent and affordable. I've never heard of it. Well, just listen then, and you might learn something. Zinfandel... Sounds like something you take for diarrhoea. Stop it, James. Zinfandel is an American classic, and with its intense fruitiness, its luscious texture, its hot spices, and its high alcohol content, Zinfandel is just right for the American palate. What is the American way? Bigger is better. Extra Louder cheese. is better. Uh, uh, brighter is better. Stronger is better. Extra cheese is better. Super size me is better. Something tells me this is going to be a long day. Big and bouncy Zinfandel was one of the many grape varieties brought over by immigrants from Europe who wanted to retain a flavour of their homeland. But when alcohol was outlawed during Prohibition, wine and winemakers went into crisis. As this home movie, shot by Oz in the 1920s, shows, American officials were worried about the effect alcohol was having on the people. There were far too many high-speed dancing and cocktail-shaking accidents. Gangsters stepped in and began bootlegging, running speakeasies and generally shooting up the joint. This was just for parking in somebody else's space. While in response, the FBI ensured that the streets ran with confiscated booze. But there was one glorious legal loophole in this ban on booze, making wine for use at home and in religious ceremonies, God bless those Catholics, was allowed. Vineyards actually increased during Prohibition, and so did the demand for wine. What happened in Prohibition was that people got into the idea of being home winemakers. So everybody got these big, thick, rock-solid kind of grapes without any subtlety to them, but with lots of colour and normally quite a lot of ability to make alcoholic strength. They fermented them into pretty rough and ready stuff. They often made it quite sweet as well. And so the wine drinkers, frankly, got used to these big, burly, powerful flavours. Thankfully, that prohibition fondness for heavy, sweet wine has gone, although light, sugary wines are still far too common. But dry wines are back in fashion, and the great prohibition survivor, Zinfandel, is on a roll, with many Californian winemakers billing themselves as Mr. Zin, or the King of Zin, or the Zin Man. Now, to introduce you to America's favourite grape, we're going to meet someone who still works with those vineyards that survive prohibition. Kent Rosenblum is a former vet who got sick of putting dogs down by day and making wine in his basement by night, and he turned pro, concentrating on Zinfandel. A lot of you guys call you the king of Zin, but I call you the saviour of Zin. Why did you suddenly start thinking that you could save it? We were uh, a little bit forced into it because we wanted to make wine. We could get these old grapes at $400 a ton, and Cabernet was 1000 and we found we liked it better than Cabernet after, you know, after doing it for a while and uh, realized there's a, there's a real gem out here. Kent and his friends got going in the 1970s when Cabernet and Chardonnay were all the rage and unfashionable Zin was threatened with extinction. But he doesn't grow grapes. Kent finds old forgotten vineyards and guarantees the farmer he'll buy their harvest. Saving these elderly vineyards from oblivion and providing him and his pals with Zin grapes from vines that go back to the 1890s. These old vineyards had a really 
uh, just the flavors and the character and the wonderful uh, nuances all their own. And lo and behold, they sold faster than anything else we made. They sold faster in Cabernet, they sold faster in white. So what do we do? We made some more. Kent has a deal with a superb old vineyard in Sonoma County that was owned by the St. Peter's Community Church. So he's going to treat us to a taste of church wine from 120-year-old vines, by far the oldest vines we've come across on our trip so far. A bell sounds for the end of double history, and it's time for a drink. That doesn't look like a typical wine. This actually goes back to my uh, days of the veterinary practice. So before this, it went up a horse's bottom then. You started as a home winemaker. Right. So just like the Prohibition guys would have been home winemakers. So another thread going back into Prohibition. Was anybody ever gunned down out of the rear window of a Duesenberg over this? Uh, you know, we'd have to research that one. But it's possible. <laughs> yes. There could have been a bit of Tommy gun action. The complexities of this wine will definitely put James's tasting skills to the test. It tastes. I don't know if this is just because you've been telling stories, but it tastes old-fashioned. This is essentially a religious wine. It's a sacramental wine at heart, produced like this during Prohibition and drunk for non-ecclesiastical reasons by people who wanted to drink when they weren't allowed to. So, forbidden fruit? Forbidden fruit? The uh, sin of zin. That's it. Sinfandel. Yeah. Why do we call it Sinfandel? I rather like James's assessment of the old vine zin, and he seems to have forgotten the mass market plonk we found in the last episode. I've got him on the hook now. I just need to reel him in. <laughs> Equally keen to secure another convert, Kent provides me with some more excellent zin for what you might call homework. And while Oz pops a couple of corks, I break out the wine can. Okay, this is a view of the chap's motorhome from the art table through the easy chair where Oz Clark discusses his overdraft, the suitcases, ooh, Oz's handbag. There's a massive, massive fact about a Zinfandel that you haven't actually yet approached. What? Zinfandel is a red wine. <laughs> is that your wine fact? <laughs> You to hold it and just film me drinking Zim. So I need to be. They, they expect me to be holding right. the cap. You don't need to get that close, surely. I have to say to you, James. I think the Zinfandel is the heart, the core, red Zinfandel of California wine. I think we've established that we like Zinfandel. We rise late the following morning, temporarily abandon our camper van at Kent's winery and head into the heart of the hustle and bustle. We have arrived in San Francisco, which is not a good place to drive a bus, so we're staying in a hotel and in order to get around I've managed to find a little corner of this magnificent American city that is Forever England. In you get. Thank you. You can put some flowers in your hair. Oh no, you can't, can you? My first ever car was a mini, James. Is it? Yeah! Fortunately, Oz hasn't realised that this is a left-hand drive mini, so I'll drive as usual. We're heading for a spot where I can give James's next lesson, and this time it's geography. San Francisco is seen as the gateway to the great northern Californian vineyards, and the fact that any wine grapes can flourish in the hot, arid climate is down to a quirky weather phenomenon. I suspect Oz is going out of his way to tell me something very simple, but I don't actually mind, because out here in the foothills beyond San Francisco, I can enjoy what is quite possibly the greatest car currently in America. Now, this is really important for the geography of the whole of Northern California's fine wine industry. Inland, it would be too hot to make fine wine, except that this two-mile gap here allows an enormous amount of ice-cold air to get dragged in from the Alaska current, which is running just off the coast here. And as it gets further inland, the fog disappears, gradually becomes cool winds, then those become less cool winds, then light breezes, and eventually they just disappear altogether. 
the nearer you are to this great pile of fog and cold wind coming through this Golden Gate Bridge, the better the conditions uh, you're going to have for what one might call delicate wines, what one might call, oh, these awful wine words, like elegant or perfumed or refined or blah, blah, blah. Ponzi. If, yeah, Ponzi, thank you very much. Ponzi wines need cool conditions. Nicely put. After shivering in the fog for 20 minutes, I decided to continue classes somewhere more convivial, somewhere populated with the bright young things of today, quaffing everything from old-style Zinfandels to trendy Pinot Noirs. Oh, you're going to love this place, James. It's called Vino Venue. It's cool, it's modern, there are absolutely loads of really trendy wines to taste, and it's mechanical. The mechanics take the form of automated dispensers that operate with a kind of wine credit card and in return dish out fruit-based drinks from around the world in very small doses. Keen to keep James on track, I start him on the Zinfandels. So I press that, yeah. Is that it? I'll, I'll try then. Yes, they've swapped the centuries-old simplicity of generously tipping a bottle for 21st century penny-pinching. It's not much, is it, really? It's not going to last long. These dribbles are never going to satisfy our manly thirsts. I thought if I kept my finger on longer, I might get more, but it's too intelligent. Oh, sorry, Jesus. I accidentally <laughs> pressed it twice. Stop it! <laughs> my God! However, the exact measures do give me an idea. You know what you could do with this machine? Admittedly, it's a bit of an expensive way of doing it, but you could make blends. Because you could put a squirt of that, a squirt of that, and a squirt of Zinfandel. James wants a blending competition in which we each make a new wine and test it out on the San Francisco public. Well, I think it's a great idea, as not only do I get to teach him about the subtleties of blending, but surely I can win this one. Right, two dollars for that squirt. Right, there you go. This is five dollars a shot. You sure you want to do it? Yeah. We had to find some way of entertaining ourselves because, of course, at these prices, there was absolutely no way we were going to get clattered. Mmm. Is it getting now? Yeah. Grenache is a wonderful blender. You need to add some sex to a wine, shove in some Grenache. Excuse me. Would you, would you like to try my blend that I've made? Sure, I would love to. <laughs> And tell me honestly what you think. Don't just be polite because I'm a foreigner. Uh, so, what will these wine lovers make of James's blend? Is it? I like it, yeah. Tastes like hot honey. Kind of like honey past its prime. Yeah. Melty and dirty. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted melty it to have a slightly... And, James, this wine is now <laughs> melty and dirty. Not exactly a great tasting note. My hirsute rival may have blundered around adding dribs and drabs of God knows what, but I know just what I'm after. A splash of zin, a drop of syrup, and a controversially a soupçon of Sauvignon Blanc. So what will these San Francisco sirens make of this improvised nectar? <laughs> what do you reckon? You do it like has it. has a good finish. You like that. Which one do you prefer? I think I like one to me. Yours was better right off the bat. Purer. Yes. More classically balanced. More flavour. And one to me. With the score at one all, we need a decider. And then I spot the spittoon. Put that in and see if you can tell me all the different things that are in there and the nationalities and the, of the people who spat in it. Shall I? Yeah. No. Go on. I'll do it if you don't. This is not faked for television. Well done. It's a mixture of Zinfandels, don't tell me. <laughs> it's port. <laughs> is it? And it's also, someone's actually stuck a cigarette out and it's disgusting. I know what it is, it's Watney's Party 7 mixed with cochineal. It's, it's, it's like port. It's very dark. It's like a pub carpet, isn't it? It's That's just it... like a pub carpet. It's like old, old cigarette stubs on a Sunday morning when you wake up in the wrong place on the floor. It's disgusting, isn't ah. it? It's filthy. Drinking the spittoon was a big mistake, and we declare a draw before things get out of hand.